All right, well, good morning. Uh, I'd like to start out just by thanking uh, Jeremy and Nick Priana for <laughs> inviting me to participate in this uh, conference. It's a real privilege to be here and to share data and also to share ideas. One of the nice things about this meeting is that it's very small and intimate. There's people from many different backgrounds, and so you get to hear a lot of different perspectives on, I think, a really important topic that we're all grappling with. So I'm going to talk today about some work uh, that we've been doing uh, to look at immunogenicity uh, in biotherapeutic development, largely from a CMC context. So this slide should need no introduction by now. I'm sure from many of the presentations yesterday, you know that uh, immunogenicity refers to the production of an unwanted immune response directed to biotherapeutic. And um, the hallmark of immunogenicity, one of the things that we typically track in industry is the presence of host antibodies directed against the biotherapeutic. And so we're looking then at anti-therapeutic antibodies, ATA, or anti-drug antibodies. Some people also call them human anti-human antibodies, ha-ha. Human anti-chimeric antibodies, haka. They all mean basically the same thing. And clinical consequences vary. But since they can be quite profound, we pay a lot of attention to immunogenicity. So this is high-profile concern for us in industry, and it's certainly something that's gotten the health authorities uh, very engaged over the last number of years. Immunogenicity can impact safety and or efficacy, uh, and especially as more and more therapeutics are being developed for chronic use, and in some cases lifetime use, the potential implications of immune responses are very important to understand. Dr. Eisenhammer had a Terrific example yesterday of uh, neutralizing antibodies to beta interferons, which in some cases can take many months to years to actually develop in our RMS patients, but which can have really very profound consequences. The data that comes from immunogenicity strategies uh, is really uh, very pivotal. It's used for many different things. Uh, for us, even as we're uh, dreaming up, if you will, new biotherapeutics, trying to design new medicines, uh, we may have a, an immunogenicity component in our target product profile. Certainly the data from our assessments goes into IND filings, goes into CTDs, BLAs, and so on and so forth, so it's really pivotal data. FDA and EMA require that we look at immunogenicity, and uh, we also have a lot of inf information on immunogenicity that's captured and summarized, if you will, in product insert wording in the United States, SMPC in the uh, European Union. And there are, in recent years especially, uh, sometimes uh, post-marketing commitments that relate to immunogenicity that can uh, uh, require a significant amount of effort on the sponsor's part too. So this is a classic, if you will, drug development pipeline starting with research on the left and going all the way through uh, preclinical studies in orange. Uh, clinical trials in sort of light green and then into the marketplace in darker green. And once a molecule comes out of the gate at Genentech, out of research and into early development, it goes through uh, an initial risk-based assessment and we have a very robust cross-functional dialogue around what the risks of developing an immune response are and how severe those consequences might be. And a lot of the recommendations around this are captured in many industry white papers. It's something that we apply uh, very systematically to all of our protein therapeutics. And so on the basis of that, we'll develop then our immunogenicity strategy, how we develop our methods, how we develop our study designs, how we implement testing within the context of studies. And so we're gathering information on immunogenicity in our animal studies and in our clinical <coughs> trials. When we look at immunogenicity in our animal studies, we're really doing it to help inform uh, interpretation of data from the animals. We're generally not doing it because we think that the results from our non-human primates are going to be completely predictive of what we see in the clinic, but nonetheless it's very important information for us to uh, accrue. So once we've gathered data from our immunogenicity uh, testing in our animal studies and all through our clinical trials, we basically will have uh, a lot of information. We summarize a lot of that in a uh, sort of integrated summary of immunogenicity that ends up in our BLA filing. We also have information that goes into our USPI, uh, SMPC, and so on and so forth. And so a lot of data then gets uh, accumulated and very carefully interpreted as we're developing a biotherapeutic. 
the culmination of this is frequently uh, distilled down to a number in a product insert that people will quote and bandy about, and there's oftentimes a lot of dialogue around how immunogenic one molecule versus another are. Uh, this is a, a data set from a series of pr primarily monoclonal therapeutic product inserts, and they are arranged here in, in uh, chronological order with the sort of more um, early uh, approvals at the top, the more recent approvals at the bottom. They're color coded according to the type of uh, therapeutic, so red for chimeric, black for humanized, and so on and so forth. And the column there that has a black line around it is the uh, anti-therapeutic antibody percentage, which is reported in the uh, product insert. In some cases, there's more than one number. That's because we are looking at a particular therapeutic for more than one indication. And as has been mentioned, I think, already, uh, the degree to which you'll see immune responses may vary tremendously from indication to indication. Uh, rituximab being a classic example, having a very low rate of immunogenicity in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but significantly higher rates in rheumatoid arthritis and uh, other uh, autoimmune type <laughs> indications. Immunogenicity can have a range of different potential impacts on a biotherapeutic. Uh, I've listed uh, the sort of main categories here. You may detect an immune response to a biotherapeutic in your assays and actually not see any clinical sequelae. And so listed at the bottom here is that there may be no clinical impact. Conversely, you can have quite profound clinical impacts. You can have hypersensitivity responses. You can have uh, loss of efficacy. Uh, you can have impacts on um, pharmacokinetics. There was quite a lot of dialogue around this yesterday, so I'm not going to dwell on this slide, but I would like to just mention that, again, uh, it's really important when you're looking at an immunogenicity data from our studies to be looking at it in concert with pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic safety and efficacy readouts so that you can really understand whether the signals that you're seeing in your immunogenicity assays are linked to other uh, changes or not. So while we in the development organization are uh, essentially putting our molecule through its paces in animal studies and in the uh, clinical trials, as I've already showed you, our colleagues actually in the process side of the world are doing something similar. What they are doing then is developing and uh, sort of maturing, if you will, a process. They're also oftentimes figuring out what the optimal delivery system will be what's the best formulation and so on. And so as we are doing our risk-based assessment and developing our immunogenicity strategy, concurrently our CMC colleagues are doing a potential critical quality attribute assessment early on. And on the strength of that, they will name a number of CQAs that they then track during the development of their process during the accrual of clinical data too. And they will ultimately end up at the end of this period with a commercial control system. And the components of that control system are driven by data from the CQAs that they are tracking. Um, this is, again, sort of an ongoing iterative process. And at Genentech, it's something that's done uh, in concert with the work that happens in product development. And so uh, both things are done in a highly multifunctional and cross-functional way. And again, the commercial control system is something that gets locked down and is then used for a very extended period of time, typically. So figuring out what should go into it and conversely what does not need to be controlled is a very important uh, component of the work. So over the last several years, uh, the biotech industry has begun to adopt quality by design approach to manufacturing. This is something that's been in place for a small molecule therapeutics for an extended period of time, but QBD for biologics is a relatively new area. And over the last several years, there's been a number of workshops that uh, industry and health authority participants have uh, been a, a part of to try and understand how one might actually apply QBD to uh, biologics process design. So again, as a molecule comes into early development, we're trying to figure out what quality attributes for that molecule really matter. And we do that using a scheme that's shown like this. And I should point out that, that this schematic is modified from information that, that's in a, an online document called the AMAB case study. And if you're interested in 
uh, QVD at all as it's applied to biologics. It's a really phenomenal resource. It's on the CATS website. It's something that's the fruit of just endless hours of interaction and debate between the uh, biotech industry and, and, and the FDA, actually. And so it's a great thing to uh, take a look at. But so as you're looking at a particular quality attribute and trying to figure out how critical it is, what you do is basically try and draw together everything that you know about that attribute. And we t tend to do this residue by residue for monoclonal therapeutics. So we'll say, okay, well, there's a particular modification or amino acid in this particular position. Do we think that's going to have the potential to impact the biologic activity of the molecule? its efficacy, could it change pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics, is it likely to help drive an immune response, will it matter from a safety perspective. And as we're asking those questions and trying to understand whether we need to control amounts of whatever it is, uh, we'll tr try to draw in prior knowledge, what do we know about this molecule, have we had this molecule in the clinic already, have we had related molecules in the clinic or in animal studies. Um, do we know anything from in vitro studies that we can apply to this? Is there anything in the literature that, that we can learn from other uh, publications, uh, other molecules perhaps with similar structures? And so we go through a dialogue around this and as a strength of that uh, conversation, we'll figure out which attributes we do at the top here and don't want to control. The ones that are high criticality, obviously we need to put in our control system and set ranges around the ones that are not so critical, we will not set ranges around, not have in our control system. So again, this is a really important dialogue to have. For a typical monoclonal antibody, uh, product variant CQAs could be uh, those such as the ones that are listed here. And again, this is not for any particular monoclonal, and I think you will find a similar listing in the AMAB case study. But so you might worry about a few calculated glycan levels if you have a monoclonal therapeutic whose uh, mode of action is primarily via infection function, in particular ADCC. Uh, you might worry about gal alpha one gal levels. If you have that particular sugar, as, as many of you will recall, that particular sugar on the uh, FAB region, actually cetuximab caused first dose um, hypersensitivity reactions in patients uh, who for to be determined reasons, I think, had pre-existing IgEs, and so on and so forth. One of the areas that there's been just a huge amount of debate about recently has been uh, the aggregate uh, area and to what extent aggregates really do or do not uh, have the potential to drive immune responses. And there were a couple of really nice uh, presentations and a lot of dialogue around this yesterday. And sequence variants, disulfide variants, and so on and so forth, all of these things get hotly debated in a sort of cross-functional setting as we're trying to figure out for any particular monoclonal what we want to control and what we may not need to control. So as a consequence then, immunogenicity has always been a key metric of product safety, but now it's becoming a key metric of product quality as well. And so we do really have to think about this very carefully. A lot of product-related variants are assumed to have low immunogenic potential, the amidation, glycation. Some product-related variants and some process-related impurities, on the other hand, may be able to lead to an increased risk of immunogenicity. And so those are the things that we may need to control from the perspective that they may enable driving of an immune response. So again, aggregates, sequence variants, host cell proteins, LPS in the context of prokaryotic uh, production systems, and similarly CPG DNA, and there's a really nice talk yesterday which addressed to a certain extent uh, how one might use uh, re reporter systems that have uh, TLR re uh, reporting systems based into them to look at LPS and CPG content and material. And again, this is all driven around the need to understand what the significance of low levels of any of these things might be in our products. So if we have a new molecule and we're trying to figure out if it's safe to go into a clinical trial or not, first in human study, how can we really figure out what our risks for an immune response are? There's a lot of data that you have to hand. You'll have probably an IND enabling analytical characterization data package that's going to be full of a lot of really sophisticated data from NASPEC, QAAA, uh, LCMS, SIGMALS, many, many different 
biochemical and biophysical tools. But at the end of the day, the, the results from all of those studies really won't tell you whether your product's going to drive an immune response or not in a particular patient population. You'll also have a lot of information from IND enabling animal study data, and, and a lot of this may in fact be from non-human primates. But again, that doesn't really translate perfectly to what you'll see in the clinic. Um, you also will have information from a risk-based assessment, but that's done in a theoretical way. And although you may have a sense for what your sequelae might be based on that and what you know about the underlying biology of your therapeutic, you really don't know for sure whether your product's going to drive an immune response in the clinic or not. And there are a number of different tools for immunogenicity uh, prediction, a number of different technologies as well. A lot of these have been used for some time now by companies that do uh, lead identification, lead optimization, and again there were some nice presentations around um, protein engineering, if you will, to reduce uh, the uh, frequency of T-cell epitope content. And, and so uh, we started to wonder to what extent one might be able to use these kinds of tools to help uh, assess immunogenicity risk prior to first in human. And so this slide I'll step through very quickly because again there were some very nice talks that addressed this yesterday, but so there are a number of different ways of uh, looking at immunogenicity risk with these tools. There are in silico uh, methods to look for uh, T cell epitope content. There are basically in vitro experiments, if you will, to look at MHC peptide binding. You can look in vitro using PBMCs or DC T cell interactions at interactions between uh, different cell components of the immune system and look for basically metrics of T cell activation, lots of different ways to do that. And there are also in vivo systems that one can look at. Um, typically these are uh, engineered mice, uh, not skid mice, DLT mice, HLA transgenic mice, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course all of these are uh, somewhat uh, synthetic systems because you can't do the experiment that you really need to do, which is to put the uh, material with different levels of aggregate or sequence variants or whatever into a human population and ask the question. And that's really the only data that's going to tell you if you'll get an immune response or not. And of course, from an ethical standpoint, from a logistic standpoint, and so on and so forth, you can't do that experiment. So you have to make do with data from these surrogate systems uh, instead. So we wanted to look to see to what extent uh, data from these immunogenicity risk ranking tools might help inform our decision making. So what we did was actually create a panel of samples to put into a series of risk ranking tools. We took a monoclonal therapeutic uh, with a what we call a sort of classic, if you will, IgG1 kappa uh, Genentech uh, framework. It's a framework that we've used for a lot of our um, clinically uh, uh, validated, if you will, monoclonal therapeutics. This particular uh, therapeutic was a lyophilized drug product, uh, it had been formulated for sub-Q delivery, and we actually had a robust immunogenicity data set from clinical studies as well. So going into this, we kind of knew what the answer was, so to speak, from our studies in uh, disease state individuals and in healthy volunteers too. So from our particular monoclonal, we created a test panel of samples uh, we used extreme temperatures actually to generate aggregates and we went on to do a fractionation or aggregated material that was created uh, so that we could have a series of um, fractions that were enriched for content of monomer, dimer, high molecular weight aggregate um, so that we could look comparatively at these preparations. We also wanted to compare those to reference material which is akin to what went into the clinic and of course we needed to use excipient as well. So we created sterile aliquots of all of these preparations in a blinded way uh, and we characterized them and also stored them so that we could put them into the systems. We've done a fair amount of biophysical and biochemical characterization work. Uh, I'm not sure how well you can see this in the sort of really brilliantly bright room here but this is Secmals and this is just showing you what the sort of size distribution if you will of material is in the different preparations. So over on the right hand side here you can see the super high and tight peak from our monomeric preparation. You can also see reference material which is mono, monomer and then with a tiny, tiny amount of dimer. 
a dimeric material was enriched for dimer, but certainly not exclusively dimer. There's still a significant amount of monomer left. And our big mirrors, we call it, or high molecular weight aggregate, uh, is primarily high molecular weight aggregate, but clearly there's still some uh, dimeric material left too. So this is just one uh, data set from uh, some biophysical and biochemical characterization work that's been done to look at the samples that we then took and put into our test systems. So the idea then was to create the samples, put them into our test systems, and then do a meta-analysis, if you will, to look at data across the within and across the test systems. And I'm going to sh not going to show you all of the data that uh, I have here, but I'll show you some of the data that we've generated. Uh, and so one of the first uh, systems that we looked at was a PBMC uh, model. Uh, and again, there was a lot of descriptions yesterday of, of the different kinds of uh, PBMC-based methods that one could use to look at T-cell activation. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, how the system works. Suffice it to say that there are several different formats. We used the CD8-depleted PBMC uh, preps, uh, and uh, these uh, assays are actually established uh, at a number of different uh, biotech and pharma companies now, and they're also provided by uh, a number of uh, companies that, that uh, have actually really very uh, well uh, refined methods and great panels of super well characterized donors as well, like our colleagues here at Proimmune. So there's a lot of uh, great um, uh, assays out there that one can tap into. And so we used one of these to look at our uh, sample set. So the particular uh, assay that we did used, again, PBMCs. We uh, had PBMCs for, from a panel of 53 healthy donors. We had their HLA profiles carefully selected. The idea was to match them as best one could with 53 donors to the uh, distribution of HLA allotypes that would reflect uh, the North American and Western European population. And then we established bulk cultures from these and incubated them with samples for uh, eight days. Um, our test samples were run at 50 micrograms per mil. This is all done blinded. And we actually ran most of the samples uh, with or without filtering at 0.2 microns, the idea being that if there were subvisible part pr particles present in these preparations, a 0.2 micron filter step would eliminate these. The metrics then are to look actually at antigen-induced uh, T-cell activation, we looked at T-cell proliferation, and we also looked at IL-2 output. Um, and we actually spent quite a lot of time looking at the data. Uh, we have a, an in-house uh, stats person who is uh, by now quite well versed at, at looking at data from these kinds of methods, and so she's helped us do a lot of the statistical analysis on the work. So this is just one of the data sets. This is T-cell proliferation. This is looking at maximum stimulation index um, over time. And what you can see then on the y-axis is T-cell proliferation, uh, a value greater than 2, which is right down here, will be considered a positive stimulation index. And what you can see in the little box and whisker plots then from left to right, each one of these little um, cells, so to speak, holds data from uh, 53 uh, donors. This is all done also in massive, massively parallel, uh, so there are multiple replicates for each donor. And in the case where a donor gives us a value uh, for T-cell proliferation that's down below our threshold, it's just shown as a little blue dot. So each dot is data from one donor. If a person actually gives us a value that's greater than two, then what we've done is assigned a symbol uh, to that result, and that's shown as positive. It's above the uh, sort of decision threshold of two here. And so what you can see is that with uh, unfiltered and filtered monomer, with dimer, with unfiltered and filtered, unfiltered and filtered high molecular weight material, with excipient, with reference material, there are a handful of positive responses here, but no huge differences between these. So there's no massive change uh, with our high molecular weight aggregate fraction, for example, by comparison to monomer or reference material. We did have a series of controls in this, and this top left panel here shows you uh, in very in very tiny scale, so to speak, that uh, KLH, one of our positive controls, is off the scale here, and you can see the KLH responses relative to everything else. And so these are all very low-level responses, actually, to this particular uh, series of samples. We looked at T-cell proliferation. We looked at IL-2 output as well. Uh, just because of uh, time allowances, I'm not going to get into all of the detail in a lot of detail, but I will show you a heat map that we pulled together to 
compared data from those two different uh, metrics because those data were actually generated in independently run assays, although in assays that were run with samples from the same panel of donors. So what you can see here is, is a heat map. Uh, each row of data is data from an individual donor. Each column of data is data from an individual sample. When the little cell is gray, it means that a donor had a negative response to a particular sample. When the cell is blue, it means that that person had an IL-2 response but not a T-cell proliferation response. When it's yellow, the converse is true, so they had a T-cell uh, stimul activation event, so to speak, but not an IL-2 event. And when it's green, uh, both of those events occurred, and you can see that for the most part, there's good concordance between the two readouts here. But what you can also see is that mostly we're seeing a sea of gray here, particularly for the high molecular weight aggregate samples, which are these guys right here. And so again, the order from left to right is monomer, so unfiltered and filtered, dimer, then we have our four high molecular weight uh, columns here, then we have our excipient, then we have reference material. And so although we are seeing some amount of activation, and in some cases there's actually pretty nice replication between, in this case, the blinded rep reps for uh, our material, there's not a huge amount of difference between the different uh, sample preparations that we looked at. So we had two different sets of conclusions from this particular assay, and some of them were system, if you will, conclusions, and some of them were really sample conclusions. So from the perspective of the system, the in vitro results actually showed very nice consistency. The KLH control showed that we had robust responses from 98% of our donors, which is really what you need. Our uh, monoclonal samples, uh, a small number of donors, so 2 to 18%, depending on the sample exactly that was used, showed robust responses, but ranking the relative ability of samples to stimulate the system in this case is really hard to do because these are relatively ro low response rates. And of course, part of the challenge here is that you're limited to a panel of 50 donors or 40 donors or whatever. And so sort of extrapolating what might happen there to what you might see in a study of 200 or 2,000 patients becomes rather challenging. So, so we came to the conclusion that the system probably is useful to compare the ability of samples to drive a response back to an appropriate control, so for risk ranking. But again, in this particular case, because we had all uh, low signal strengths, it's very hard to rank reliably. From a sample standpoint, we looked at filtration. Again, this is around removal of subvisible particles, and there's no significant effect on the responder rate. Similarly, look at, if you look at the sample types, there's also no statistic statistically significant effect on responder rates. So in this system with this monoclonal, we don't see an impact of aggregation on T-cell activation. And interestingly, our data is quite different from some of the other data that's been published and discussed where aggregation has a clear impact on T-cell activation. And the next slide shows you actually that. So, so this is data that I just showed you. Uh, I'm showing you just some of it. So on the right-hand side here, you can see our excipient control this is T-cell proliferation. On the left-hand side, you can see data from our heat-induced aggregates, and this is the monomer, I'm sorry, heat-induced material. This is monomeric material, and this is high molecular weight aggregate material, so excipient monomer aggregate. What you then see, as I put the next graph down, is a data set that was been, that's been presented actually at a couple of different conferences. This data set's actually from exactly the same uh, system. Uh, it's the same uh, type of experimental design completely, but you can see really a rather different result and maybe a little bit hard to see in the uh, brightness again, but on the right hand side here, here are some, uh, and I don't know what this monoclonal is, I do know that these data are all from the same monoclonal therapeutic. This is from material that was shaken and these are control in the blue and then large and soluble aggregates in the kind of green color and then there's free saw uh, material here on the left hand side and again control and small soluble aggregates. So these larger insoluble aggregates that are generated by shaking are having quite a, an impact actually on the stimulation index and oops sorry let me just go back if I can yeah yeah and so here's a decision threshold and again you can see our our results are largely down below this threshold, whereas many of the results from this particular sample here are again up above that. And 
Dale like this is um, in the literature and there's a lot of concern about the uh, impact of aggregates or the potential impact of aggregates on biotherapeutic quality as a, cons as a consequence of data. Uh, but it, it seems that actually there's a fair amount of variability between what's seen depending on the molecule that's used, depending on the conditions that are used to create the aggregates as well. And so I think to come to the conclusions that all aggregates are always bad um, is maybe not the right place to be. So looking at another system, going back to our panel of samples here, we look very briefly at a human artificial lymph node system that is uh, relatively new to uh, the public domain. Uh, this is pulled together and the idea here is that you can actually uh, use this to do a longer term exposure of uh, your therapeutic uh, mul with multiple stimulations, if you will, in vitro. These cultures can run for up to 28 days. They're run in a uh, very interesting uh, sort of three-dimensional system that enables differentiation actually in B cells and D T cells and, and in theory at least a reasonable system for antigen presentation. And there's some very uh, fascinating data again in the literature which shows that if you take one of these systems and stimulate it with Habrix, you get a very nice change in the amount of total IgM that the system is actually putting out. And so we were curious to see if we could use this system to generate uh, any kind of responses to any or all of our samples. I'm not going to show you all of the data. We do have an enormous amount of data. I'll just show you a small amount of representative data here. And this is data from one uh, donor. Uh, so these ALN systems typically are created using PBMCs from one donor and you can run a series of ALNs in parallel for an extended period of time. So what we did again is we took our panel of samples uh, and again this is so uh, monomer, dimer, two reps of high molecular weight aggregates. This is then excipient formulation buffer uh, and then there's another buffer control over way over on the right. And so what you can see in the uh, sort of green, uh, green um, histogram is total IgM output from one donor and on the red histogram is total IgG output. You can see also that there's not a lot of consistency, no real trend if you will between uh, immunoglobulin outputs in this and actually only looked at data from other donors too. Uh, the patterns vary from donor to donor. We're not seeing a lot of consistency either in total uh, immunoglobulin output which is shown here or in the time course of immunoglobulin output either. We wanted to see if there was any amount of antigen specific immunoglobulin produced so we developed a particular uh, Im immunoassay to look for antigen specific uh, immunoglobulins and data from that is shown on the bottom and again this is just results from one donor, one ALN system and this is an XY plot. What you can see on the uh, left hand side here is the average signal from our uh, anti-therapeutic antibody assay if you will and then this is actually a time course. What you can also see is just three different uh, samples that I'm showing you here. This is uh, let's see now monomer in the light blue high molecular weight aggregate in the dark blue and formulation buffer in the purple. And there's basically not any uh, difference between these profiles and all of these are very low by comparison to a 5 nanogram per mil positive control which was, would give us a signal up around here if we run it in the assay. So we're not seeing uh, a lot of uh, antigen specific stimulation here. So our system conclusions from this was the system at least uh, with a particular uh, set of circumstances and conditions seems to produce IgG and IgM in a constitutive manner uh, and while there is some amount of output uh, that seems to be similar regardless of sample type. We actually looked at uh, output a number of different ways and even if you do a sort of subtractive analysis pulling out uh, what you see with formulation buffer or excipient you really don't see any clear trends at all between the other biological samples and we couldn't see any evidence of antigen specific uh, ATA output. So the system didn't really enable us to have any sample analysis conclusions because at least for the analysis that we did here uh, it really wasn't consistent enough to assess the impact of sample type. So interesting system but perhaps not quite ready for prime time at least for our particular purposes. We also looked at our panel of samples in an in vivo system. This is a system of uh, transgenic mice that were actually uh, engineered to express a mini repertoire of uh, human IgGs 
uh, by a couple of my colleagues in Basel, Antonio Iglesias and Juliana Bessa. And the idea here is that if you can create a uh, transgenic mouse that is tolerant to monomeric human IgG, you can then <coughs> look to see if that mouse will mount an immune response to IgGs that have been modified. So from left to right here, if you take a wild type mouse, so the uh, animals that the uh, transgene has been engineered into the background from and stimulate with a human IgG, you should see an immune response. If you take a transgenic uh, model and uh, stimulate them with the same human IgG, you should see no immune response if you've done your engineering and characterization appropriately. And if you take the uh, transgene and stimulate these animals with material that has been modified in some way from the monomer, so either aggregated or in other, some other way chemically modified, do you see an immune response or not? So do you have the ability then to look at what's able to break tolerance in this particular model? So what Antonio and Juliana have done is actually created a series of different transgenic lines of mice and there's actually just data from uh, three of those lines here. We've primarily focused on one of those lines, but this particular data set shows you that these mice are actually immunocompetent and they're also tolerant to monomeric human IgG1. So on the left-hand side here, what you can see is data uh, XY plots of immunoassay results uh, from animals that have been stimulated with KLH. Uh, the gray column is results from a cohort of animals that were exposed that were wild type. Uh, the kind of orange, blue, and green columns are data from three different transgenic lines that they created. And then the little black bar here is from some naive animals. And so these are basically wild type animals that have, have not been exposed to anything. That's, so they're sort of unexposed, if you will, control. So what you can see is that all four of these sets of mice actually mount quite a healthy response to KLH stimulation, suggesting that they are indeed immunocompetent when you challenge them with uh, that type of uh, neoantigen. Over on the right hand side, what you can see is how these animals respond to a human IgG1 uh, molecule, monoclonal therapeutic with kappa light chains. And you can see that actually the uh, wild type animal uh, has a quite strong response. The three transgenic lines don't, and as you might expect, also the naive control animal does not. And similarly, at the bottom here, you can see how uh, the animals respond in a similar experiment exposed to a human IgG1 lambda monoclonal therapeutic. And so, again, you can see quite a nice, strong response with the wild type animal. This data at the bottom is actually just from transgenic line 17 in the naive animals, and actually it's line 17 that we've primarily uh, worked with. So we put the samples then into this particular mouse model to see to what extent we saw responses. And what you can see here, again, is a series of XY plots. In this case, again, the y-axis is the uh, assay signal. This is the immunoassay data. Uh, and the little boxes show you data from uh, mice exposed to different preparations. So reference, monomer, dimer, high molecular weight aggregate, and then all the way over on the right-hand side, buffer. And in each little box is actually three data sets from a wild type animals, transgenic line 17, and also from the naives as well. So you can see that, as you might expect, the wild type animals have a nice, strong response to reference material, um, and the transgenic animals don't. Uh, there's a little bit of noise here, which is why there's a sort of red, red dot here with our uh, naive control. But you can see that, for the most part, these data are what you would expect. Similarly, with monomer, you get a response from some of the wild type animals, generally not from the transgenics. Then when you expose them to dimer and to high molecular weight material, that's when you can also see not only uh, the wild type animals, but also the transgenic animals are breaking tolerance actually both with dimer to a certain extent to some of the animals and also with the high molecular weight material as well. And there's no shift in the profile from buffer. So this is an interesting system. We're still uh, looking uh, very carefully actually at the uh, mechanisms that are involved in establishing tolerance actually to human IgGs in the system and what's involved in breaking tolerance too. Uh, but it's certainly a system that we uh, plan to continue to use. And so, again, there's a couple of different sets of conclusions here, some of which are around the system. So the mice, the transgenic mouse model that we have, is it's immune competent, responds well to KLH and other challenges as well. And 
and we actually have a fair amount of uh, flow data looking in detail at the um, uh, sort of ontogeny, if you will, of B and T cells and then the mice are tolerant to monomeric human IgG ones with, lam with lambda and kappa uh, light chains uh, and the wild type mice are not tolerant uh, to the same uh, types of uh, monoclonals. So the system can be used to uh, look at samples. Some transgenic mice do respond to dimer and high molecular weight aggregate. Our ranking ability here is, again, kind of like the PBMC system, somewhat limited by the cohort size. So if we're able to do this in 50 mice or uh, a larger number of mice, we probably will be able to do a better job at ranking. But when you have a relatively small cohort size, your ability to see things is somewhat uh, um, impinged, if you will, upon by uh, how many animals you have overall exposed. So conclusions, so certainly immunogenicity is a key metric of product safety. It's also now a key metric of product quality. Uh, immunogenicity assessments in the context of biotherapeutic product and process development are really key to do. They're certainly multifaceted, should be done in a multidisciplinary way, and they're highly nuanced. This is not an easy area to work in, and I think we're all still going up the learning curve uh, on this. Uh, immunogenicity assessment tools that have been developed for lead identification and optimization can be used to look at sample rankings. But I think in terms of how the data really do translate to what we might see in the clinic, I think we're, we certainly want to see more data before we really understand the extent to which the rankings that we're seeing in these tools and in other tools too truly will uh, translate, if you will, to what happens in the clinic. So I think this is an area that's still evolving. Uh, it's a fascinating area and one that's actually very important, I think, from a product safety and quality standpoint. I'd like to close by just uh, thanking a large number of people that I've had the privilege of uh, working with on this and other aspects of immunogenicity. And if there's any time left, I'd be happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tyler. That's very, very good. Uh, I was intrigued that your transgenic mouse, which I assume is only a heavy chain transgenic, or is it heavy and light transgenic? Heavy and light, yes. So it's, it's human kappa, human lambda, and human gamma light transgenic? Correct. Okay, great. Yeah. So do you know when you break tolerance with your larger molecular weight species, which parts of the molecule you're giving antibodies against? We are looking at that right now because I think the sort of underlying, well, the underlying mechanisms around establishment of tolerance in this model and then breakage are fundamental to, you know, sort of interpretation of the data. So we're looking at that right now. We have some and studies on that. Are the responses class switched? I'm sorry? Are the responses to the human immunoglobulin class switched antibodies? Are they IG, mouse IgG, anti-IgG? Uh, Yes, I think we're seeing class switching too. To suggest that it's a, a T cell yes. in the response. Yes, yes. In fact, we, Antonio and Juliana have done some very elegant experiments uh, where they actually do it, deplete these animals of T cells and can ablate the responses, which, which would suggest that T cell health is needed for these immune responses. So we have done more um, biophysical characterization work that I yeah I didn't get into here, and yeah we've also looked at the the, the yes so microns you mean so so visible right yeah in the ones that from up and yeah yeah so we've 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 looked at that and the filters do essentially eliminate those particles. There's not a huge amount of content of those particles in these samples to begin with, however, which is probably why we're not seeing a huge shift. It was a very great set of data. Thank you, Valerie. I um, was wondering if you thought the concentration in your PBMC assay might be related to why there was no signal there versus in the mouse that gives you comparable 
fairly comparable with I, the, one of the challenges I think with comparing data from not just these systems but with other systems as well is that with any biological system there typically is a dose response and you've got to pick your dose for the system and when you pick your dose for the system you're not necessarily always using the same dose across systems if you will. Uh, we have done dose titrations for the mouse model um, and I don't think these doses are exactly analogous actually. With the mouse model what we tried to do was get these animals up to um, circulating concentrations of this therapeutic that will be analogous to tr trough levels that we see in the clinic. Uh, with the in vitro systems we were actually um, picking a concentration that has shown, been shown from other experiments to be a, a, in the right ballpark, if you will, to see uh, stimulation if indeed it's going to happen. So I've got our questions relating to the, uh, the PDMC assays that you uh, were presenting there. So um, in that particular context, obviously there were some quite substantial differences between the data that you supported and also the data from the PRC yeah. presentation. Yeah. Um, Maybe comment on, on that a little bit more, but also um, in the, the setup of the assay, because I guess one question you could consider is the difference between the, the PDMC assay and the whole protein, and that's the blend of the quite thing where whole protein stars yeah. essentially can be presented in a bit more of a natural way. Yeah, so, so the, the two data sets that I showed sort of side by side are from exactly the same setup. So PBMC derived T cell activation using the whole protein. Um, so I don't think the differences there are around um, assay design. Um, I think the differences are more likely around two different things actually. I think that um, the, the way that proteins get aggregated matters tremendously. Um, and I also think that uh, the data may vary depending on which monoclonal therapeutic you're dealing with, uh, which is also related to what's happening from an aggregate standpoint actually. So we're doing quite a lot of work to characterize these and other um, unaggregated and aggregated proteins that we're looking at in these and other systems at the moment and it's a really intriguing area um, but to me the data that you know I've seen so far would suggest that having generic limits that you can apply to every monoclonal in the same way uh, in control systems. I, I'm not entirely sure that that's really what the data is going to end up telling you and I, I don't know if anyone else in the audience would like to comment on that. Yeah, yeah. And one more question though, on, on the method of stress treatment, and I was wondering why you guys chose the high temperature stress treatment, which is kind of, uh, I think you said up to 75 degrees, and if you think that that's a relevant, if, if that's relevant to what we kind of see with our products. Yeah, so I, I hope it's not relevant <laughs> to what we see with our products. What we were actually trying to do, and what, what turns out to be really difficult to do, um, certainly with this monoclonal and potentially with some other monoclonals as well, is generate stable dimer preps that we could enrich and then have um, sustained as a stable prep for long enough to put into test systems. And so we actually looked at a number of different ways of uh, generating aggregates and this was not our, our um, I won't say it wasn't our method of choice, this was not the first um, method that we looked at actually uh, and again I'm not sure that what our experience with this particular molecule is is necessarily um, translatable to every other molecule because they all have you know slightly different biophysical and structural characteristics which may um, lend them to be more or less likely to generate stable dimers as you probably know um, but yeah it's a challenge. So I hope we never get to that point with material even at the end of shelf life or after uh, you know shipping um, severe adverse events, shall we say. Um, 
But I think one of the other challenges is that there's a lot of literature in the data on aggregates being really bad, and much of that data is from proteins that have been massively abused in a way that generally would not happen uh, to biotherapeutics that are being handled carefully either by the manufacturer or by pharmacies and so on and so forth. And so I think to kind of inject a note of reality around what biopharmaceutical samples look like with tiny amounts of aggregate that may occur naturally versus these more synthetic samples that we're generating here that may end up being great controls but may not really reflect what's happening in uh, uh, the, the real world. I think it's important to uh, get that out in the public domain as well. Are these families reversible? Sure. There's table, actually. Um, let's see now, are they reversible? Do you mean, can we go back to monomer? Mm. You know, I, I hesitate to answer that. We've looked at these samples um, an extended, we looked at these samples an extended period of time after they were generated, and they still, the dimer samples still had the same degree of dimer content that they had when we originally characterized them. So we recharacterized them actually a long time after we had generated them to see if they were still the same or not. Um, so they seem to be stable, but I, I guess I hesitate to say any more than that simply because there's more to be done, I think, around characterization there. Yeah. 